Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we have changed a little bit uh, the format of our webinars. They're shorter, but uh, they're more oriented to approach specific tips for you to learn to manage uh, certain topics. So today, uh, the next one, Ms. Roxana, please. So today we're gonna be talking about virtual learning essentials. Uh, we're gonna focus mainly on executive functions. Next one. But first, uh, we want to start with this mantras for parents uh, as we start a new school year. Um, we don't need all the answers to get started. Everything is figure, it, figure out able. My child, their teacher, and I are on the same team. We don't know the full plan yet, but we will figure it out. Together, we can do hard things. This is hard, but we can work together for solutions. So these are some mantras that I would like you to keep in mind for the rest of this school year. Well, so what is executive function? Next one. Executive function describes a set of cognitive processes and mental skills that help an individual plan, monitor, and successfully execute their goals. These executive functions might include attentional control, working memory, inhibition, and problem solving many of which are thought to or originate in the brain's prefrontal cortex. Any process that requires time management, decision making, and storing information in, in, in one's memory makes use of executive function to some degree. And since much of modern life is process driven and, and demands that individuals set and meet goals, Disruptions in, in executive function can make it challenging for someone to succeed at school, at work, or even at, at, at our whole, uh, house. For children, uh, for children and adults uh, who struggle um, with executive function, accommodations at work or school can help fill the gaps. However, it is important to remember that executive function is among the slowest mental process to develop. Uh, never let many children and teens uh, who struggle with them uh, may find their way uh, to improvement and they, they will find, uh, they may find that their skills can catch up over time and continue to improve well into adulthood. That is because executive functions can be trained. In fact, they need to be taught and modeled because they are life skills. The next one. So now let's, let's talk about each of them to understand how difficulties in, in, in each of these functions or areas might look like and what can you do as parents to help improve them. So we're gonna start with self-control. Uh, we're gonna present uh, um, scenario that some of you might be familiar to or not. Um, so it says a third grader scribbles on the virtual classroom screen while their teacher shares a video. When he is redirected, he turns his video camera on and off several times. So this might, might be a situation that exemplifies kind of a lack of self-control, right? So what is self-control? Mm -hmm. Self-control is the ability to stop and think before acting. So now we're gonna discuss some tips that you can implement to improve self-control. The next one, Ms. Roxana, please. So the first tip is uh, help kids avoid temptation what is out of sight is out of mind, right? We can all succumb to temptation. Who hasn't, right? Uh, even the most self-controlled adults can lose their willpower. And we all know that. One of the most important tools for maintaining self-control is to change the environment. 
for young children, this might mean um, keeping electronic distractions away from, from areas where, where, where they usually do homework. Uh, and, and you can go further with older kids. You can teach them how to identify temptations on their own and take the necessary action to eliminate them. Another tip is to play games that help kids practice self-control. Anytime we ask kids to play by the rules, we are encouraging them to develop self-control. Uh, actually, that's kind of uh, some of the things we do in our office with children um, to teach them to follow rules, to you know avoid uh, when they they want to cheat or uh, some other or to learn strategies to play some games because uh, some games are more challenging than others, and board games are a great option. For example, Jenga, Clue, uh, Twister, even puzzles are 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 good alternatives. They are wonderful alternatives for screens. I, um, I'm gonna share later in the, in the chat with you a website that provides great suggestions by age and, obje and, and different objectives uh, for different types of games. If you're not big fans of board games in, in your house, uh, try to implement a family game night. You, can, you could have like a, like a Friday, Friday family fun day. Uh, it's, it is not just about the quality time, it's also helpful to to have a plan for Friday night, since you all will be probably exhausted from the week, right? Okay, so another sec executive function is self-monitor. Self-monitoring is uh, made up of two main areas. The, the first one, I'm sorry, um, okay, I'm gonna go deeper on, on self-monitoring. Let's read first this scenario here so we can understand how self-monitor might look like. A third grader gets angry every time the teacher gives him feedback on his work. When the teacher tells him to review certain parts, he gets frustrated and takes it personal. So this, this is related to self-control, which is the ability to view and evaluate oneself. Um, as I was saying before, uh, self-monitoring self -monitoring is made up of two main areas. One is observation. Uh, in which a child is able to identify a specific behavior, thought, or action that had occurred. This might happen um, during the action or afterwards. This level of self-monitoring, it can be a real struggle for some students. This stage of observation requires a lot of reflection and the ability to recognize an ideal response or a proper behavior for a specific situation. The other area uh, that, that made up uh, self-monitoring is recording. Okay, this stage of self-monitoring is a means for moving from the awareness of, of actions, of, from the observation, um, to function. In the recording stage of, of cell monitoring, children are able to know their actions and make changes based on what happened in specific situations. The next one. Well, what can we do to help uh, children improve self-monitoring? Uh, one recommendation is to make an outline for writing tasks homework assignments or multi-step multi assignments in order uh, to keep the child on task. Checklists are a great tool for self-monitoring because they help the student to go through different steps of a process. Also, another one is to uh, try to index cards or other visual reminders. Uh, you, can put, you can place them on, on desk or the wall. Um, and you can uh, write a, a different. Uh, you can write different um, behaviors that that you are that that you have discussed previously and are expected behaviors. Uh, it's hard to stick with the program if you don't remember the rules. Uh, and young children have more trouble keeping the, uh, our directions in mind, so they are easily distracted. So this. This uh, strategy of writing them the expected behaviors, putting them around, uh, 
it's very helpful to remind them about our, our expectations. Next one. Okay. So now we're going to talk about emotional control, but I would like you to, to, I would like to invite you to share. You can write them on the chat or you can unmute yourself uh, to exemplify a, a situation at home that can be a sign of difficulties in this area. Okay, remember that emotional control is the ability to manage feelings, to achieve goals and complete tasks. So please, please, please feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me, let me share with you one. For example, temper, temper, temper tantrums are a great example of difficulties with emotional control. Anybody else? Okay, well, uh-huh. I think one of the things I've noticed with my son is that he gets more emotional. Exactly. Yeah. Be, being emotional, it's also a sign of, can be a sign of struggles with emotional control. Mm -hmm. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, describe them later when we're talking about the tips. Crying of the feedback that comes from, from, from me, from mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some kids are more emotional than others, that, right? And, and, and that, that could be a, a, a response when they feel like they are in the spotlight or they did something wrong. Children who are very sensitive to what others say or think, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also low tolerance for frustration. Uh, kids that seems to explode with the minimum thing, right? Okay, thank you for sharing. Well, the next one, Ms. Roxana. So how can we help kids to manage their emotions? Well, the first one is to be an emotion coach. Adults react in different ways to, to a child's negative emotions. Some, some parents are dismissive, like for example, oh, that's no reason to be sad or you don't have to cry for that. Another might be disapproving, like stop crying or why do you react like that? These approaches are not helpful because they don't teach kids how to regulate themselves. By contrast, kids, need, kids benefit when, when parents talk to them about their feelings, when parents show empathy and discuss in a constructive way how to cope with those feelings. Researchers call this emotion coaching and it is associated with better child outcomes. So we invite you all to be emotion coach. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we're gonna share some resources where you can learn more about this. Uh, another tip is to explain the difference between feelings and behaviors. It is also important for children to learn how to express their emotions uh, in a socially appropriate manner, like scream, screaming loudly in the middle of, of the grocery store or throwing a temper tantrum at school, they're not okay. Tell children uh, that they can feel any emotion they want. That's when we validate their emotions. We're validating with their emotions. And it's okay to feel angry, sad, scared. But make it clear that they have choices in how they respond to those uncomfortable feelings. Remember that there are no, not uh, right or wrong emotions or feelings. We have pleasant or unpleasant, comfortable or uncomfortable feelings. So even though they feel angry, it's not okay to hit, okay, for example. Or just because they are sad, that doesn't mean that they can roll around through the floor crying when it disrupts other people. Discipline their behavior, but not their emotions. Say, for example, uh, you're going to, to, you're going to, to uh, have a timeout because you hit your brother. 
okay? Or you're losing this privilege for the rest of the day because you're screaming and it turned and it hurts my ears. In that way, we are disciplining, we're disciplining their behavior, but not their emotions, okay? Okay, so next one. Okay, now let's talk about flexibility, okay? Flexibility is the, uh, the ability to adapt to changing conditions by revising plans or changing strategies. Can you think of some situations at home that can be a sign of difficulties in this area? Please feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. I think, um, sorry, I, I hope you can hear me, but I think one of the things that um, has been actually positive from, from the pandemic is um, definitely, I think, um, at least with our son, the first couple of months um, of, of, uh, of the year with, with being at home and at school, um, sort of, uh, sort of uh, learning to adapt to that self-discipline of following a schedule, you know, making sure that even if they're at home, they take enough time to do their work correctly, um, you know, and at their best effort. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, at least for me, I've seen that, that at least in our son, that has been one of the, let's say, uh, things that has worked um, with flexibility in terms of adapting to virtual conditions. And I think uh, having a little bit of structure, um, and as you said before, I think, uh, you know, we have posters on the wall to remind him of, of what it is that he needs to do, right, um, in a virtual setting. And I think that also helps him to sort of focus and remember that this is a new way of working and it was fine, you know, if he wasn't used to it at the beginning, but definitely now with the learning and experience, then he can put that in practice and learn something new, right? Thank you very much for sharing. And yeah, you're right. Yeah, Th those things that create a structure and routines are very helpful uh, to anticipate, you know, changes because flexibility, so, uh, some uh, childhood struggles with, with cognitive flexibility might find it uh, in intolerable or difficult to switch from play mode to school mode, for example, or transitioning between tasks or subjects. So uh, kids with poor flexible thinking skills may, resi may, may resist learning uh, new ways of doing things. Okay, so these, uh, can we go to the tips? Okay, uh, as Ms. Maria shared, these are great tips, creating structure and also find more than one way to do everyday things, okay? Uh, your child might be used to do, to doing things in a certain order. So making small tweaks to everyday process can show them uh, that there are different options, okay? Uh, another tip, it's to teach them self-talk skills. This is, this is a very important mm -hmm. skill. If you want to know more about this, I, I invite you to, to check on the resources that are at the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, when we teach children to talk uh, in a positive way, uh, they change their mindset and, and they, they can go through solving problems and like, for example, as they get older, self-talk becomes more important. You can encourage them to think out aloud when they are solving uh, problems. For example, uh, is this similar to another problem I've solved before? Uh, is there, if there's something different here than I haven't come across in, in other problems, these kind of questions aloud help them to talk to themselves and to think about possible situations. Um, and now Ms. Roxana will continue with some other executive functions. Thank you. Hello everyone, nice to see you. For those who don't know me, this and my name is Ms. Roxana and I'm the elementary school counselor from early childhood to second grade. Okay, so next we're going to talk about task initiation and this is something um, that causes a lot of struggle with some children. And one example of this is, let me read the example. During independent work in a meeting, in a Zoom meeting, a fifth grader gets ready to start his activity and for a moment he gets distracted by an online game and gets hooked, losing track of time. 
So maybe the teacher needs to be calling his, or his name and ask him to start the activity several times. And I'm sure that this could also happen at home with chores that they have or different things they need to do. So task initiation is the ability to start and finish tasks without procrastinating. So usually we expect children to initiate a task after the first or second prompt. Think about your child and even yourself if it is easy or difficult to initiate task after the first or second prompt. So one tip for this would be well, reduce or eliminate distractions and having the materials that they actually need available. We need to, and we talk about uh, this in last year in, in one of our webinars about how important it is to have an environment where children can focus on what they're supposed to do. So for example, if they need to start a session and they'll need pencils and paper, not having those materials available will delay the task initiation. Another tip is to make sure that your child understood the instructions because sometimes they don't start because they don't know what to do. So you can ask them to explain the instructions in their own ways, in their own words, to make sure that they understood. Some of the tips are the same for different executive functions. They work for different functions. Okay, so the next one is organization which is the ability to develop and use systems to keep track of materials and information. So now um, I invite you to share in the chat or you may unmute yourselves, one situation that you find difficult regarding organization. You can share with us in the chat. This might happen to adults also. So if you have an example, you can share now. Okay, my Heidi wrote, my daughter struggles with managing all of their Gmails. Her inbox is a mess. Okay, this is a, this is a 21st century skill that we all need to learn how to organize our emails. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Okay, let's see some tips. Okay, I have another comment here. Part of it is having a designated place for learning. Yeah, this is, this is a first step we need to take to help our children organize themselves. So the first step is, again, me, I know Ms. Batista also mentioned this, but this is really important for organization. Use a checklist and color code task into categories. So it, it's very useful for all of us to have like a to-do list every day, and then maybe we can uh, prioritize from that list one or two tasks that we need to do first, and then we continue in order. And then we can color code like, okay, the yellow ones are the most important ones, the red ones are the ones that could be delayed or the least important, and so on and so forth. This could also help for emails. We can teach our children to make different folders in our emails or Google Drive and color code those folders for them to visually um, find them easier. The other one is use a planner and create a habit of writing on the planner every day and checking it every day. So we all grew up in the, in the era of agendas. I don't know if our children use more like electronic ones, but it's very important to create the habit of writing in our planner every day and checking, and then we can add our checklist to that planner. For example, now we have Google Calendar and we have Google Keeps and other apps related to Google that can help, help us organize ourselves better. Okay, the other one is working memory. Working memory is the ability to use information held in memory to complete a task. So we have, basically we have long-term memory and short-term memory that which is associated with working memory. Long-term memory is everything that we remember from the past, like memories that we have from long time ago or information that we have already learned and that we know by heart. And it could be information or procedures such as how to drive a car, how to ride a bicycle, how to swim, etc. 
And the working memory is a short term memory, things that we need to remember right away and that help us follow directions and use that information to complete a task. So some of the tips are work and visualization skills. Whenever there's a project your child needs to comply with, you can ask them to create an image in their mind about how would that project look like and you can even ask them to draw it. And also have your child teach you, okay, how would you do this? And then while they're telling you how to do it, they are reinforcing um, the information and it will stay longer in their memory. There's also a lot of games, working memory games that can help uh, improve this skill on your children. And last but not least, planning and time management. So this is the ability to create steps to reach a goal. And one situation might be a fourth grader that fails to complete her daily assignments on time. At the end of the week, various tasks have accumulated and the parents and the child feel that time is not enough. And this is very important because um, usually we only understand time as something we need for work, but um, if you like baking for a baking cookies, you need to have time management. If you leave the cookies longer in the oven, you know, we might not be able to eat them later on. So some tips that we can use is break the project into smaller steps. You can guide your children through this process at the beginning until they learn how to do it. Like have a, have a, have a, like a big goal, which is related to the project and then break it into steps and set like little goals and give feedback as your child completes every step. And then assign realistic deadlines to complete each step. Okay, so you break the project into steps, you write little goals for, for each step, and then you set those deadlines. And after each deadline, then you give feedback. So we would like to finish with this quote, which I think it's very powerful. Our children aren't bad kids, they are human kids. They make mistakes. They get angry, sometimes are rude or grouchy. It's never okay to treat others badly. And of course, they should be taught that. But when we correct them, let's do so bearing in mind that we ourselves are sometimes guilty of the things we are correcting them for. So also reflect a little bit on your own executive functions. And maybe you and your child can learn together. Here are some resources. We're gonna share the whole presentation video with you and the, like the PDF as well. So you can check on these websites for more tips and strategies. And then we open the chat and the microphone. We have seven minutes left for questions. So if you have any question. Or comments, comments are also welcome. Do you wanna share something? This is a lot of information, so. Yeah, executive functions, it's a very important topic. And it has so, it has so much information that, but if you want to dig in a little bit, you know, learn more about each of these functions and how, and there's so many other tips for each one. Uh, do you want to learn about that? We strongly recommend going through those resources that we uh, include at the end. Uh, and there you can find more about them. And of course, to be attentive of, of when a struggle with this executive functions might become like a, like a difficulty, uh, a more permanent difficulty that not, might be approached uh, in a special way, okay? So, so we have a comment here. Haiti says, oh, do the teachers work with their students to develop executive functioning skills or is that more the role of parents? Well, I will say it's a joint effort. <laughs> it's a team effort, yes. Um, of course, school is always modeling this, you know, uh, the, 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 the whole learning environment provides great opportunities to develop these skills, to learn these skills. But also, uh, and, and that's how we wanted to, to, 
to focus a little bit how it might look like in the virtual setting because this virtual school that we are uh, all um, coping with right now it has put in evidence that there's a lot of, of struggle and lack of, of this executive function. So you at home might, may do many, many, many things uh, through, through the shores, through the, you know, sharing responsibilities, encouraging them to be more active at home, helping with, you know, household and, and things like that. Uh, for example, washing the car might be a great opportunity for, for them to develop planning and organization strategies. So think about what can you encourage your kids to do at home that might help them develop these skills? Because at the end, these are life skills. You're welcome. Hi, could I just also comment to, to uh, all the parents in the audience. Hi, sorry, I, I'll turn on my video. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted just to add on to that, that if you are finding that your child is struggling uh, with some sort of organizational skill that's related to the to managing um, the learning at school from virtual school, please reach out to the teacher and explain that to them so that the teacher can work with your child to help set up uh, a system that works for them. I can assure you that our teachers uh, work so and, and uh, really their lessons are designed so that that organizational skills are built into all of the different uh, lesson instructions. But sometimes, you know, it's difficult for kids to catch all of that virtually. So if you're finding that your child is struggling in a particular class or um, with a particular assignment, then please do reach out to the teacher and explain that to them so that the teacher can provide the support that's needed. Thank you, Mina, Ms. Amina. Yeah, and that, that, as, as we said before, it's a joint effort. It's a teamwork. Uh, we encourage you as parents to work closely with teachers. Teachers are here to help you. And we as counselors are also here to support you. Okay, so please don't hesitate to reach us mm -hmm. whenever you need it. We are uh -huh. Yeah, I also, before, before we close the meeting, I, I want to read a comment that I think is very important and by Orly Da Silva. And it's that the Ivy recognizes a need and it has implemented it in our curriculum throughout the, the skills, approaches to learning skills that include organization, research, and thinking, planning, and mindfulness. So it is, it is a, a, as we mentioned before, a joint effort. And it might be a little bit more difficult uh, to implement that with a, uh, in the virtual school, as Ms. Lacour said, but we are also here to support you in everything you need. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your com company. Remember to check the materials at the uh, counselor's website and we welcome you uh, every week on Thursdays, 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much.